This is a list of gear that I've found significantly changes the way I make content. Now that could mean that it makes it better, it could mean that it makes it easier. Those are the two biggest things that apply to everything we're going to talk about in this video. This video is sponsored by the Professional Photographers of America. Join a community of over 34,000 photographers and find equipment insurance, education and business tools made specifically for small business owners like you. And you're probably going to notice that this video is shot in two different locations, that's because I needed to add some things and then I got sick and it just became this whole rigmarole, so we'll do our best to fix that in the edit. This first one is the Expo Disc, and if you set custom white balances for whatever it is that you shoot, especially if you shoot weddings or events where cheap LEDs are used and there's some pretty funky color lights that come in sometimes, it's really hard to get an accurate custom white balance, and I don't like carrying around a big white balance card or gray card with me, so that's where this comes in, and the way this works is it clips to the front of a lens. I've got an 82 mil one here, but they do different sizes. Ambient light comes in through the front. And on the rear, it's the same color as a gray card. It's not just a random white, like it's an actual color designed for being a white balance tool. You then go in and set your custom white balance. You overexpose a little, and it gives you a perfect white balance every time. And I've used that a ton this year. It just goes in my little bag, which I'll show you in a bit. And just such a integral tool now for my workflow when it comes to if I'm at a venue or shooting something and I need a custom white balance, I have that with me. It's just easy to use. It's not the cheapest in the world, I'll tell you that, especially for a piece of plastic, but for a tool that you use very frequently, highly recommend you try out one of those if you need to set a lot of custom white balances. This is one of those pieces of gear that is just, it's not that exciting because I had a 24 to 70 before, but it's practical. And that is why it's made the list for me. When Sony brought this out, I already had the Sigma 24 to 70. It wasn't a focal length that I needed to change to because I already had one. It's the features that this has that made it appealing to me. It's smaller, it's lighter, it has Sony's new tech in there in terms of the autofocus being more linear, so it acts more like a non-focus by wire lens, which is really useful if you need to jump into manual focus and go between a couple of focus points. It behaves very similar to a non-focus by wire lens. It also has the declicked aperture there, which is really important for going from bright environments to dark environments, which happens a lot at weddings. You can quickly change the aperture and it's a lot smoother. If you had it clicky, it's gonna be a lot more obvious and you're gonna see the changes when it's declicked that makes it much more functional for video at least you got your custom buttons on there as well which i actually assigned to change it from autofocus to manual focus it does have that autofocus manual switch on there but i actually just push a button that changes it to manual focus push it again it changes it back to autofocus very useful very convenient and the fact that it is not technically a par focal lens but it behaves almost identically to one and what that means is if you're focused at 24 and then you zoom into 70 that focus is not going to change so that's pretty useful and uh, it's something that you really want to appreciate till you start to use it. If you do have an A7 IV, the focus breathing is going to be handled a lot better with this. Any of Sony's newer cameras, those kinds of features, that tech, it's going to work very well, play very nicely with the new 24 to 70 GM from Sony Mark II. So nothing really that exciting in terms of what I'm using this for because it's a 24 to 70. Everything I was using a 24 to 70 before, I'm now using this for. It's more the features and everything that's been packed into this. Now this next one was one of those things where you didn't really need it, but I always consider the time to upgrade is when you have issues or you can't do something with something that you want to be able to do and there's a newer version of something that does that. Uh, and that was why I upgraded from the Mavic Air 2 to the DJI Mini 3 Pro. Now, some would say, well, that's actually a downgrade. In some respects, it is. But in other respects, it's a huge upgrade for a number of reasons. The biggest one, firstly, is that I guess it seems now that I'm starting to travel a little bit for work. And with this, it's under 250 grams. So most countries in the world, you don't need to register it, which means you can fly it and you don't have to worry about potentially having issues because it's under the legal limit for registering. It also has 10-bit color, which means you can do a ton more when it comes to color grading. You can get a much nicer image out of 10-bit, gives you more play. Often, yeah, if I'm throwing the drone up in the air really quickly, I might just shoot in auto just to get the shot. With 10-bit color, it just gives me more ability to fix that in post. White balance issues, 10-bit just yes please 10-bit on everything moving forwards and I love it. Battery life on this actually as well is better than my Mavic Air 2 was and I really do love this drone for that. The other big one inside this, which you haven't been able to do since the original DJI Mavic 1, Mavic Pro 1, is vertical video filming. You can literally just be flying and hit vertical and it rotates the camera and has now a vertical field of view. And a lot of the content that I'm creating now for client work, for reels, is vertical. And instead of having to crop and not really know if I'm getting what I want when I'm shooting it, 
I can just shoot vertical, get exactly what I want. And I actually think I've shot mostly vertical with this since I've had it. The next thing that maybe want to upgrade was the controller. I was so tired of having to plug in my phone and have a cable connected. And if someone called in the middle of it or just fumbling about with your phone before you just take off, you don't have to do that with this. You turn it on, it connects, you take off, you have a screen that's really, really bright, very easy to view in daylight, much better than my phone. And you don't have to worry about it. It's just good to go in a matter of seconds. I really do love this thing. It's a huge upgrade for anyone that has come from a phone. Once you, you try this, you'll quickly realize how did I ever use a phone before? Just not having to worry about that is massive. The only issue with this is this does require an internet connection for maps. Now, if you know in advance where you're going to be flying, you can obviously go onto it uh, and just kind of cache, let it cache where the area you're going to be flying is. So that way you have the maps on there. Otherwise, the maps just appear as blank and you kind of have to fly blindly around and hope that you can return home or rely on return home automatically but for the most part i'm normally flying where i can see the drone or i can see myself on the screen here so i know where i took off from so that's not an issue um, you can obviously hotspot from your phone to this if you wanted to so this has an internet connection and then we'll give you the gps which allows you to view the maps on here as well so that's something to bear in mind that's really the only negative with this whereas on my phone when it was connected to the original controller it always has internet so it always had a live view of the maps but i can deal with that for all the other pros that this brings with it. Now, this video is sponsored by the Professional Photographers of America, PPA. Whether you've got a newer photography business or a more established one, you know very well that there's certain things that you have to do that you didn't really sign up for when you started making a photography business. You might have already done all those. You might have been slacking and not done them. You never know what is going to happen. And if you are a photography business that relies on using your gear and something does happen, you don't want to be in that situation. You and I both know how much that gear costs, and if something does go wrong, you need to have a way to protect it. Now, for a low monthly price, PPA will give you up to $15,000 of equipment insurance. So if something does happen to your gear, they'll give you a full replacement for a $350 flat fee deductible. Or if you prefer, you can get it repaired, and that is a $50 deductible. Now, one of the least exciting things when it comes to running a photography business, and something you definitely didn't think about, is the contracts. Any clients you're working with, whether you're doing weddings, portrait shoots, you gotta have a contract in place to protect you and the client that you're working with. You're gonna kind of steer clear of having to deal with contracts when you first start because you just don't know. You don't know what needs to be in the contracts, the terms that you need to be using. But another benefit of being a member with PPA is they give you customizable contract templates that you can cater directly to your business. PPA is a great resource for you no matter where you're at, no matter where your business is. Everything seems good until something goes wrong and you might think, oh, it's not gonna to happen to me. It will happen when you least expect it, when you least need it to happen. You don't want to have to deal with that extra stress in your life, as well as dealing with eight weddings that are backlogged and 5,000 photos from each. Set it up properly, do it the right way now, save yourself from that extra pain and that extra headache in the future. PPA is here to help you with those things. If this sounds like something you're interested in, you want to maybe learn a little bit more, you click on the link down below. And that'll take you directly to their website, but they'll also give you a special discount on your PPA membership too. Thank you, PPA, for sponsoring today's video. Well, let's get back to talking more about gear. The DJI RS. Three. Now I use gimbals a lot for real estate, for weddings, for general content, for making for this channel as well. And I had the RSC before the RS2 and they were fantastic gimbals. In my opinion, DJI makes the best ones. They're reliable workhorses and that's what you need in a gimbal. You need it to balance everything you can put on it and just work. And that is what most of them, even since the original Ronin did very well. But there's one feature on this that really makes this and the RS3 Pro, the only gimbals now that I ever want to use. Essentially, these little locks that you're used to have to unlock to be able to use the gimbal, once it's balanced, you don't ever need to touch those ever again. They automatically unlock when you turn the gimbal on, when you turn it off or you put it into sleep mode, they automatically lock, which means it's so much easier to travel with, to go between locations with, and it's just so much more pleasant to use, and it ruins using any other gimbal ever again. Because of the nature of what I do, I'm traveling around a lot, going between different locations. I'm constantly, or used to be constantly locking, unlocking, and that just becomes a pain. It's not difficult, but it just becomes a pain. And when you don't have to do that anymore, that for me is a big deal. And that's why I picked the RS3 and RS3 Pro. This next one is just been a game changer for me. And I've talked about in a full review, which I'll put up here with all the details of why I love this thing. But the DJI mic, I swapped to this this year for I swapped to this this year for weddings and first year I've ever used wireless audio at weddings and 
massive game changer for just being able to hear the bride and groom when they're they're viewable in the camera, but you can't necessarily hear them. And there's a ton of great audio that happens that you might want to mark for when it comes to editing the wedding or for creating content for reels. So that's been huge for me. The fact that it records internally as well. So if it does become disconnected, um, not through distance, but more through different buildings that you're in, like I was shooting a wedding and it had a tin roof and the groom was just standing outside, maybe 50 meters away, but this lost connection because of the tin roof, but there's a hard copy of the audio built directly in when you're recording with the transmitter. My only gripe with this is that there isn't a way to lock a lapel mic on with a Tascam DR10L, which is non-wireless, which is what I was using before at weddings. That wouldn't come unplugged because you'd screw it in, but there's no way to lock in with this unless you like duct tape it. So has that been an issue yet? No, could it be an issue? Absolutely, so I'm always on the edge with that, but we'll see. I'll figure out maybe a solution for that in the future, but just changing to these this year has been huge for me. If a lapel does come unplugged, it actually gives you a little notification on the actual um, receiver there itself. There's the phone mounts in there if you want to just create content on the go with your phone and not use a lapel mic or anything like that. These have magnets on the back so you can just clip it directly to a shirt. There's so many reasons why I love this system and if you're looking for a wireless system, a cheap, easy or cheaper it's a bit more expensive than some other ones out there, but just the best value, I guess, wireless system. The DJI mic is absolutely, without a doubt, it. As I said, video will be up there for you or down below. Absolutely love that mic. And this is the reason why you're seeing so many people change to that mic now is because it is really that good. Another one that is just not exciting, but you will use it and never go back. And that is a fast card reader. Now I have the one from Prograde because I use all of Prograde's SD cards. These things are not cheap. I think I paid like $90 US for this. This connects via USB-C and it will be faster than your internal card slot on your MacBook, than the card slot on your studio or whatever it is that you have. And it will just dramatically change, at least for me, the way you import video. It went from being a much longer, long drawn out process at the end of a wedding day to dump all my cards, which are often full. I often have like three, 400 gigabytes of stuff. And you know that that takes a little bit of time to transfer. This dramatically decreased the amount of time that that took. And when you run a business, you hear everyone say all the time, time is money. Get yourself a fast card reader and you will not regret it for a second. A little bit of money up front, but immediately pays for itself. Sony makes a really solid one of these as well. It's a little bit more expensive. That's why I went with the Prograde one and it's just an incredible piece of gear. Now I actually bought the wrong one to begin with. They make uh, a few different versions of this. They all have the SD card slot. In this case, it is a UHS-2 slot, which is why it's so fast. But they also make ones that have the CF Express Type A and Type B. And for some reason, I bought the Type B one to begin with and it wasn't worth returning. So I bought a second one. So now I have one connected to the computer, which I use with the CF Express Type A cards because I have a Sony camera. And uh, this one just goes in my bag and I use it when I'm out and about traveling at home, whatever, just for using from the UHS two SD cards. Get yourself one of these, treat yourself. Believe me, you will not regret it. This year for weddings, I opted to put filters, specifically black pro mist and black satin filters on my lenses for weddings. Talk about the difference between the two in a second. But the reason I wanted to do this is because weddings are often shot in the middle of summer in the dead middle of the day where the sun is really, really bright and things when it's shot digitally with 4K cameras, they don't always look the best. Black Pro Mist takes the edge off of that. It really softens things, just gives things a real nice glow and just creates a, a softer transition between the highlights and everything else. And for weddings, that is a really, really nice look. If there's fairy lights or little lights, it just creates that little glow, has a beauty effect. Pair that with like the 50 mil f1.2 at sunset and you can just get some absolutely stunning video. I really, really love Black Pro Mist on my lenses for weddings. With that said, there are some times I've learned this year that Black Pro Mist isn't the best for certain situations. And for a while I was using them for videos like this and uh, I shot a whole video where there were I was shooting, I think it was a gimbal video, and I had them on for when I was shooting the screen of the gimbal, the back of a camera, and I realized in the edit, it was too late, it was already shot, that do not use Black Pro Mists, especially the 1.8 versions, which is why I use for shooting screens uh, and LEDs, because it just, it does not look good. It's not a good look. The other thing to not use them for is for really, really backlit situations, because it just creates a glow 
example, I'll put one on the screen right here. It creates like a horrible halo around people when it's just a real, real backlit image and it just blows the image out completely. And it's really hard to salvage that even when shooting in S log three. So for those kinds of situations for really, really bright lights doesn't have the best look. So you might not want to use black pro mists for that. But for everything else in general, I run with them for most of the wedding day because I just like the look. And that's what got me looking at black satins, which is essentially the same thing as a black pro mist, but with less of the mist. So if you are shooting on a black, black, if you are shooting on a, a very backlit environment, it's a lot less hazy, a lot less misty. And so that's where the black satins kind of come in. And these just give a real nice soft look for everything. You could use one of these black satin filters. So I use the black satin three. Yeah, three uh, all the time if I can on a lens. I just like that look. It softens things. It looks less digital. It just creates a, a nicer, more pleasing image that's just good for everyday use. Now, microphones, they're not the most glamorous thing in the world, but they play a very vital part in how we capture audio. Now, this was a mic that earlier in the year, and I think still now, was extremely hard to get a hold of. I love these mics because when you attach this to a camera, that is it. There is nothing else on there that you need to connect. There's no cable. It goes directly onto the top of the Sony multi-interface shoe, which is the hot shoe, and it communicates with the camera and allows you to record audio without any extra cables, which makes it quicker, which makes it easier, which makes it less things I have to think about. There's no battery required. It's powered from the camera. It's an expensive, but very useful piece of kit that I have found. This is the only mic I use now. I have this one and I have the smaller one as well. The smaller one has less capsules on the top there. Very happy with the audio quality. For weddings, I'm running with both of these. If I'm out and about shooting videos outside, I'm running with both of these. It can be both digital and analog. You can control it on here. The automatic level actually works very well, surprisingly well. You've got different patterns that you can set it to. And one of the patterns actually, if you have it as a full pattern all the way around there, but it will pick you up from behind as well. So if you want to interview someone or if you want to vlog and talk about what's going on in front of you, it will pick up the sound from behind as well. So it's just a good mic overall for a huge variety of uses. You've got an attenuator on there as well. There's filters on there as well. So just a mic that packs a punch, as I said, costs a lot of money, but very, very happy with this mic. And it's the only mic I pick up now for whatever I'm doing, anything. If I'm using wireless mics, then I'll use those. But if it's just an on-camera mic I want, that is what I'm picking up. It just makes things easier. It's a smaller setup. Yeah. Good luck finding one though. And then I want to talk about the camera that we're actually shooting on right now, which is the FX3. Now, the FX3 obviously has been out for couple of years now but Sony updated the firmware in it this year and it very much changed the way that I now shoot with this camera it made it a better camera Cine EI is very very usable once you understand how it works if you're in environments that are constantly changing between lighting situations it's very convenient biggest one the one that everyone wants on everything now is to have a LUT in the camera. So I can transfer the phantom LUTs 15% discount link down below if you're not using those use the phantom LUTs, you will stop using everything else, believe me when I say that. But now I can put my own LUTs onto the FX3 and preview it. Like right now I can see the tungsten LUT that I like to use. Preview of exactly how it looks, exactly how it's gonna look when I throw it on the computer, I throw it into the edit, and that makes a big difference. It's better than the gamma assist that's just showing you like Sony's basic LUT. I can expose and get it looking exactly how I want it to look in camera. And that's a big reason now why I picked the FX3 over the A7S3. Before it was like, eh, it doesn't really matter whichever one I pick. They both work the same functionally. This is now a better video camera than the A7S3. And that really impact how I shoot, which is the whole purpose of this video, right? This camera now makes it easier and better for me. Now this next one is something I personally came up with myself and it's to solve a problem that I had and that was that I need to carry around things that I just don't want to put in my pocket or they wouldn't fit in my pocket. Things like filter cases, extra batteries, that little white balance tool, my mic so that I can mic up a groom and then take it back off the groom and put it back in here and not have to go back to my big bag. So I came up with this little system. Um, it's not really a system, it's my own product, I guess. You can't buy it like this, it's two separate things. Peak Design Field Pouch, which is a really nice pouch for carrying things. It's got a bunch of pockets in there, a little zipper, it's really soft. The pockets fit batteries perfectly, the Sony batteries at least. It's Velcro. And then it has the space on the back for really attaching to a belt if you wanted to. But what I did is I bought a think tank kind of like utility belt and I threaded it through the back and now I just wear this at weddings when I'm doing real estate jobs and it allows me to carry everything 
I want to carry and not have to worry about putting in my pockets. If you shoot a lot of video, you'll realize that there's not really a solution out there for doing something like that. It's like one product that fits all kind of thing. And that's why I made that. You either have to have a big backpack, a small backpack, or an over the shoulder satchel. And this is smaller than that. Doesn't really get in the way when I'm holding the gimbal. And I, I really like what I came up with. A little bit of duct tape on there as well, because you never know when you need duct tape. And that actually came in useful this year. So there we go. That is things that have made my life making video content, a little bit of photo here and there, easier this year. I say this year, it's really in general because what I'm talking about in this video isn't applicable just to this year. It's however long before I make another one of these and find more gear that is useful. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.